I, I believe there are four pillars of fatherhood that, that kind of hold up your, you know, your metaphorical house, right? Um, there's faith, family, finance, and fitness. The purpose of, of all of this is like, if I can help men become better men before they become fathers, they become better fathers. What does it take to be a good dad? Ooh, uh, <laughs> that is a big question. Um, what it takes to be a good dad, I, I say the, the number one thing is, I think you have to be an example. Um, I think that's one of the bigger things is whether you have sons or daughters for your son, you're going to be an example of the type of man he should be. Uh, for your daughter, you're going to be the example of the type of man she should surround herself with. Found I was going to become a father. I immediately uh, felt like I found my purpose. This is it. Like whatever else you're doing is cool, but this is the thing that you're meant to be here for. We're in. Oh, yeah, third no, time's no. the charm, man. <laughs> I was running up and down stairs trying to find like headphones and like trying to trying to fix my my modem, my router. I'm like, all right, maybe I, I can just do it on my phone. And I was like, oh shoot, I need to get a charger. I think it was on our end. I had it recording before we'd invited you in. I'm not sure if that had something to do with it. No, usually, usually that should be good, man. It shouldn't be an issue. So. I don't know because uh, we but... we don't normally use use Zoom or Riverside or anything like that. We 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 normally face to face. Uh, yeah. But on this occasion, obviously, special guest, we had to do it any means necessary. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate you guys changing up the format for me. No, it's fine, man. Um, I'll give people a bit of context. Uh, Roderick Richard the second. Thank you for coming on Unchained Minds. Uh, it means a lot. I'll give the people a little bit of context of what you do, uh, how we actually got in contact. Um, we had a real, we had a real go viral. Uh, I think it's on like four or five million views now about uh, morning affirmations. One of the guests has with their sons, uh, you remixed the reel. And then I had gone through your page and seen all the good stuff you were doing and talking about. And uh, obviously you've got the forfeit fatherhood, Instagram, you've got the forfeit fatherhood podcast. You've got the newsletter apparel, you're just doing all good things uh, for fathers out there and for people who are sort of struggling to find direction. What actually made you start the forfeit fatherhood journey? Oh, that's interesting, man. So um, first, let me say I, I've always, well, not always, when I found out I was going to become a father, I immediately uh, felt like I found my purpose. Uh, you know, like I was, I was working a career like most of us do chasing a bag and trying to get to a certain level of status or success or whatever I thought it was at that time. Uh, and I found out I was going to be a father and I was kind of immediately grounded in the fact that this is it, like whatever else you're doing is cool, but this is the thing that you're meant to be here for. Um, so that has kind of guided my steps since then. So that was 2012. Um, but as a father, I have to provide, right? So I continued working my job. I didn't, I didn't quit right away. I actually did quit, but I didn't quit working. I just quit the job I was working uh, and, and moved on to a different company. But what started me on the forfeit fatherhood page is, is uh, actually like right before the pandemic, um, I was kind of getting to a point in my career uh, at the company I was at where I kind of hit the ceiling. Like I was at the top and the only thing in front of me was the CEO and he wasn't leaving. Um, so I kind of stayed, kind of stalled out in my career and was kind of getting a, a little stale on it and, uh, started kind of thinking about what, what I was going to do next. And my wife actually kind of gave me the nudge and was like, Hey, you always talk about fatherhood as your purpose, but you've been kind of working with other people, helping them realize their purpose or helping them, you know, reach their goals. What about yours? Uh, and I heard her, but I kind of was like, eh, whatever, you know, this was like December of, of 2020 or 2019. So I started, you know, I started the page. It was crickets. You know, I posted every once in a while. I, I, I started a podcast, but it was like an episode every other month. I was like, I was half assing it to be honest. Uh, and then the pandemic hit. So, uh, March, March of 2020, uh, all of our gyms. So I, I, I was managing five gyms at the time. And uh, in California, all the gyms got shut down. So you couldn't go into work like all the businesses were closed. You had to shelter in place or whatever. And so it was the first time in, in a decade for a guy.
who says that fatherhood is his purpose. It was the first time in a decade that I got to eat dinner with my family during the week. Um, and my, my youngest, I think it was like a Tuesday or just like a random day we're having dinner. And she looks at me and she says, uh, she asked me why I'm there. Like, cause I don't eat dinner with them. So she's like, where, where, why are you here? Yeah. And, uh, as you can imagine, it was like a dagger and, you know, I had to get up and leave the table and, and I like, go into the room and collect myself. Um, and it was that, it was that moment. I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm helping other people reach their goals and I'm not, I'm not living up to mine. I'm not helping my kids reach theirs. And it was other stuff too. Like they had like little side conversations and stuff that I didn't know about. They had like inside jokes, my wife and my daughters. And I'm like, what, what, what's happening here, man? Where am I? Like, I, I felt, I felt like I was really intentional about the time I had. I just didn't realize like I wasn't spending that much time. Yeah. And so go ahead. What, what was the sort of hours you, what did a, a work day kind of look like for you hour wise? Okay. So, so when, in my particular position, I was training athletes and running several gyms. So I also, I had the admin responsibilities as well as the training responsibilities. So, uh, depending on the time of year, if we had a professional athletes in, it could start as early as five, six in the morning, right. They come in for the, what we call the, the morning crew. Uh, so they'll come in really early in the morning, get their workouts in, uh, at the time we had an academy program, so we had students that would come in right after they left. So the pro athletes would leave about 7.30 uh, and be gone. And then we'd have, uh, you know, K through 12. So kindergarten through 12th grade students come in and they would train until probably 2.30, right? So that in-between break when the, when, the, <laughs> when the pro guys left, I would go home and like wake my kids up and have to get them breakfast. And then I take them to school and I come back to train uh and and organize or do whatever i had to do with our with our academy program 2 30 that would be a break uh i would go pick my kids up from school drop them off hang out for like 20 30 minutes and then i would go back because we had night training as you imagine we train athletes so most of our athletes are in school during the day the ones that didn't go to our program so at the end of the day they come into the building to train um and so from four to nine uh, I would be at one of our buildings. It could be the one that's close to me. It could be the one that's three hours from me. It just depends on, depends on the day. Uh, and some days I may have to go to multiple gyms. So basically I was working from, you know, 5 a.m. to about 10 p.m. Uh, with some little breaks here and there in between. So I had a, I had a really busy day for You're a really busy, long man. time. Yeah, that, 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 that's, <laughs> that's a big day. And, and, so, and sometimes we moan about doing eight hours. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It was it was a busy day, but like we, it I was I was helping to uh, I don't want to act like we were like world beaters, but we we're we we're building the empire, man. Like we, in the twelve years I was with the company, we trained probably fifty thousand athletes, um, and in five locations in Southern California, we're the one of the biggest athletic training f performance facilities uh, in the area. So it was it was a lot to to manage and to take in. So it required a lot of responsibility and a lot of hours. Was this all level athletes or is this uh, like college level athletes or professional, say like NFL stars or NBA players? Or It, it was a little bit of everything, man. Like uh, we, we would work with anybody from eight to 18. So, you know, eight year olds all the way up to Olympic athletes. Like we had mm. a little bit of everything uh, throughout the course of the day. You could come in and see your favorite football player or you could see some seven year old who just learned how to tie his shoes and chew gum at the same time. Like it, it yeah, just yeah. depended on the hour. Where did the passion come from working with athletes? Uh, so I used to be an athlete. Uh, I'm washed up now, <laughs> but I played I played baseball and football all the way through high school. I played football in college. Um, after college, I played a little bit of semi pro. I tore up both of my shoulders actually. Uh, separated one the first game of the first season. Separated the the other one at the last game of that same season, and decided that was it for me. Um, and so my passion had always been kind of, cause I'm not like, I'm short for the position. I play linebacker. I'm 5'11". Yeah, at my yeah. heaviest, my heaviest, I was probably 220. So I'm not like the biggest guy, but I had work. Yeah, you got to be, right? you got to be beefy. You got to be beefy to be a linebacker though, <laughs> right. man. Right. <laughs> right. So I, it was always hard work and determination and understanding the game. Right. And so I've always kind of had a passion for working hard. And my idea was like these kids that are playing sports, if I can get them to realize their potential, 
right? It's like everybody has a potential for performance. My job is to help them realize their potential. And so that's kind of what helped me or kept me in, in working with athletes of, of that age range. Was what what uh, college did you go to to do uh, football? I went to Michigan Tech, so it's uh, Michigan Tech. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you got Michigan, Michigan State, Michigan, Michigan Tech. Tech. There's a bunch of schools in Michigan actually, but Michigan Tech is a Division two school. So Michigan and Michigan yeah. State are Division one. There's like Eastern Western Michigan, Western Michigan. There's Central Michigan. There's a bunch of schools yeah, in Michigan. Yeah. 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 Oh, so you you went across you went was you was you raised in California? Is that where you're from? Yes, yeah. Born so you and raised went from California. California all the way to Michigan, Detroit, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, it's funny because uh, the the coach that recruited me was from California, uh, actually not too far from where I live now, and he didn't tell me anything about the amount of snow that we were going to see, right? Like yeah. he 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 definitely undersold that, right? Because a California kid, I had I had thrown snowballs before, but I had never. It snowed eight months out of the year every year I was there. Yeah, was it was it a hard adjustment with the playing? Very, very. The from first the heat, year, from sure. the heat to all that, all that cold. The first year for sure. Uh, after that, you kind of get used to it. But like the first half of the season in Michigan is like really cool. It's it's, it's mm. the fall. There's, the leaves are changing colors. It's not too cold. It's not too hot, which is nice because in California, it's burning up the first half of the season. But uh, that that second half of the season, when it got cold, oh, it was cold, right? We it, yeah. was, it was snowstorms in the game. It's raining during games. It's ice cold. Like you, you when you tackle somebody, it hurts just to make contact. Like it was. It was different for sure, and that's and that's the one thing that's different from uh, American football to uh, soccer or, or football over in England. It's like it, it, if it's cold or icy, the game is cooled off. It's done. Like it's really? not. If the pitch is icy, where you could hurt yourself, the game is. It, it will not be played. Whereas oh, no. in in the NFL, I see the minus seventeen games last <laughs> yeah. season, and these 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 men were like running into running through brick walls. The floor was sliding. I was thinking that would never yeah. be playing in that that would not happen in England. Like no, they would call know. that game off. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, for sure. We we play rain, sleet, snow. Like it's the only thing that I guess cancels a football game is if there's thunder. Uh, they'll they'll cancel a game like thunder yeah, or lightning. Yeah. No, not even thunder, lightning. Like if there's lightning within five miles of the stadium or something like that, they they delay the game until it yeah. passes. They don't cancel it right away though. Yeah, that that's what I mean. All them small things they in uh soccer they don't really that that don't happen. Like it's just they will just call the game off and try and replay it. Like they'll never have these big five hour breaks or four hour breaks and be like, yeah, we're just gonna replay it later. They will just cancel the game. <laughs> well, yes, that's man. cool. Maybe England's gone soft, man. England's gone soft. <laughs> um, I just got—I got one last question on uh, yeah. uh, college football, and then I'll, I'll spin it back to uh, uh, your kids and that story we were going down. Uh-huh. I've always wondered this with with the tackling. Mm-hmm. You know the helmets on the arms or the helmets into the legs because there's not there's. I, I know you've got the one small bit of padding on the thigh. But mm-hmm. them hits is like helmet on arm or helmet on leg where there's no padding. Do you have to get conditioned to take them hits? Because people are taking them all through a game. You know what? I think I think you just kind of get used to it uh, when you're younger. But because it doesn't hurt as bad. As, well, now, let me not say that it it does. You don't notice it in the moment though. I'm assuming it's, it's you know your adrenaline's flowing. You know you're not really feeling it. Like you will take a shot to the thigh and get like a dead leg. Oh, that happens mm. often, right? But yeah. like to the arm even glancing blows to the legs it's not that bad um if you get like a, a bare shot to the ribs something like that might might take you down for a little while um but me and my my, my buddy we have this argument all the time because we both play baseball or both play football is i would rather get blindside tackle than take a fastball to the ribs 100 percent of the time yeah yeah, but yeah, then then balls are coming fast in baseball. <laughs> then yeah. balls, I, I'm not a big of obviously um American football, college football. I've got really into that over the yeah. last two years. So watching that, um, but baseball is just something I've never really, I've never really got into. It's quite it's similar yeah. to cricket in England, but it's it's not. I've right. just never got into it. Right. So like, okay, take cricket for example. I think the ball is moving significantly faster in cricket. But let's say yeah. let's say you're standing in and you take one of those in the ribs. Yeah, I just get tackled. Though. Just tackle yeah, me. Yeah, like, yeah. That's, yeah, that's true. That's, 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 you're broken. <laughs> yeah, like I look. I ain't even gonna defend myself. Just tackle me. I don't want to take that shot yeah, at yeah. all. 
<laughs> um, I'll, I'll spin it back to the story you were kind of getting onto. So you were doing these crazy shifts. Uh, the pan the pandemics happened. You're at home a lot more. Your your kids were saying like, "How comes you're home?" And then what you're was... an inside joke. Yeah, you're you're the inside <laughs> joke now. <laughs> and then um, what kind of changed from then onwards? So I uh, uh, I just made a decision that I was gonna I was gonna leave my job. Uh, I, I talked to our the CEO, like the next guy up, told him that what I was thinking, uh, told him that uh, I give him a few months, I'd hire whoever I needed to hire to replace me. Uh, I ended up hiring a couple of people actually. And, and then I stepped away. And luckily, uh, at that point, we had we had a pretty decent amount of savings, we had put some money away, we were doing we we're doing okay for ourselves. Um, so I was able to kind of like, just be home for a while. Uh, and I was just like, stay at home dad. Well, everybody was staying at home. My wife was working from home because things were remote. Then my kids were, you know, remote from home. Uh, they were doing zoom school cause schools were still closed for the rest of the year. Um, so I just got to be, I just be dad and, and just stay home. Um, and, and that was, that was like super fulfilling. And I didn't, I, at first I was like, you know, cause as, as a man, you want to, you want to go out and you want to hunt you want to bring home the bacon. Like you want to go do these things, right. You've been taught your whole life. Like that's your responsibility is you go out and do that. And I was, I was actually kind of surprised how much I, I enjoyed just being able to be present and, and just being mm -hmm. able to be in their presence. Right. And really show up as, as the man that I really wanted to show up as, because I felt like, and I didn't realize it, but up to that point, I had been kind of giving them the less of me instead of the best of me if that makes sense how how did you see a change in their lives yeah yeah actually um well my wife and i's relationship it, it it blossomed right we were as you can imagine if you're going 12 to 16 hours a day from your partner you got to sleep when you get home so you guys are really only spending like you know 45 minutes to a couple of hours if you're lucky and with no consistency uh we were we had a strained relationship at that point um, you know, we were obviously in love with each other and we got kids and we're going to stick this thing out, but our relationship was in <laughs> not in shambles, but it was close to it. Um, and being home, I was able to be more attentive, to be more engaged, to have more real conversations. Uh, so that, that relationship blossomed, uh, with my kids, I kind of became their, uh, like their assistant teacher, right? Because their teachers were on the computer and they're in uh, kindergarten and third grade at that time. So they're really young. Um, so I was able to like, kind of really be in the room with them and be a part of their learning process. And we got to spend all day together. We went in the backyard and played and we went in the front and we went to the park. Like we got to do all these things that had not been a possibility at all for the last 10 years or for the 10 years prior. And so, um, our relationships now, I think are as good as they are now because of the pandemic, to be honest. Mm. And then you just started with the channel and the podcast. Did you just start putting more episodes out? And yeah, yeah. So with the with the podcast, uh, the whole idea behind the podcast, honestly, is is when I became a father, I just felt like there wasn't enough information out there for me. And maybe it was just the timing. Social media wasn't huge in 2012. Uh, you know, it, it was starting, but it wasn't like a huge thing. So there wasn't like a whole lot of content around uh, the 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 baby books are literally just that baby books. They're about like the leading up to having a baby. And then you have a baby and they're like, all right, you're on your own. Um, so I started having conversations with other guys who were fathers who I thought were good fathers. Um, and, and I felt like those were good conversations. And so when I, when I took that time away from my job, I went back to that. And I was like, you know, now that I'm spending time with my family, like I, I actually need that information now. Like I need to know what's going on. And so I started having conversations with, with dads uh, other dads that I knew. And I was like, you know, somebody had mentioned a podcast and I was like, well, I, I should record these conversations because these are the questions that I have. I'm sure other dads have them. And so I started recording episodes at that point and, uh, and started putting them out. Um, and then the, as far as Instagram goes, it was, it was crickets, man. It was me and like, you know, my close friends. So it might've been like six, seven people following me for like the first year, to be honest. It was probably more than that, but it like consistent, like real followers. It was yeah. probably like the same four or five people commenting. Um, and, but I just stay consistent because like I said, I had recommitted myself to my real purpose, which was my family and, and being a father. And this stuff was like nurturing that for me. 
Yeah, yeah. When when you look back, is it all sort of surreal that you kind of you took that jump and now your whole <laughs> life sort of three sixtyed? It's it's absolutely crazy. And, and 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 even in the like real recent sense, so my daughter uh, plays plays softball, and her team uh, went to go train at the company I used to work at, and. And I haven't been there in like two and a half years, maybe three years. And so when I had to take her in to go work out there, it was like, man, I, like I walked into the building, first of all, and I'm like, I remember when we were just doing this out of the trunk of the car, right? Now, yeah. now they're in this like, you know, 60,000 square foot building with all the state of our equipment. And I was like, man, I had a hand in building this. This is crazy. But then at the same time, I felt like, I felt like a release, like relief. Like I don't have this burden on my back. Like I don't have to worry about that. Like I, I have exactly what I need. Even though I built all this stuff, I felt good about walking away from it because I walked into something better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you sort of rebranded yourself. Like, cause it must be a hard jump to go from just below a CEO to go to go <laughs> from that to just sort of being a stay at home dad and running your own Instagram account where you've sort of got to put all the uh, schedules and stuff in place. Yeah, yeah, it, it it is, but there's a lot of similarities. I tell people all the time, like, uh, family is is not much different than business. I think we put a lot of effort and intensity and, and learning into business. Like, everybody wants to learn how to lead and be a CEO and, and run a company. But your house is pretty much the same. Like, you're the CEO of your family, like, if you think about it. And, and depending on the situation, you might be the CMO. You might need to sell stuff to people, right? You might need the people in the house to buy into what you're saying. Uh, you might, you know what I'm saying? You might be the operations yeah. officer. You might be the COO. You might need to control the operations and how things are going or how people are moving around in the house. But honestly, you could run it and run it like a like a good business, right? You don't want people to be like, <laughs> you don't want them to be employees. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but you, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's very, yeah. very similar. So when I... I didn't take that same approach where I treated it like, you know, completely like a business, but it wasn't that far off. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. What, what does it take to be a good dad? Ooh, uh, <laughs> that is a big question. Um, what it takes to be a good dad. I, I say the the number one thing is the intent. Uh, you have to have an intention to be a good dad. Like you got to really want to be a good dad. Um, how you define that probably depends on the man. But I think there's some 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 kind of through ways there. Like you got to be you got to be uh, loving. Right. You have to love the people that you're you're uh, leading. Right. You also kind of have to be a servant. Right. And I, and I say that like you, you servant leadership in the sense that like my goal as their father is to make sure that they become the best person that they can be. Right. Not that the best person I want them to be or the thing that I want, like at the end of the day, when I'm gone, they have to live with whoever they are. And so my job is to serve them as as a leader. Like I need to lead them and guide them in the right way. Um, I think to be a good father outside of love, there is a level of protection that you have to provide. Um, there's there's teaching and coaching and guiding uh, that, that comes along the way as they get older. I think you have to be an example um, I think that's one of the bigger things is whether you have sons or daughters for your son, you're going to be an example of the type of man he should be uh, for your daughter. You're going to be the example of the type of man she should surround herself with. Um, and so that's a big responsibility because we all have things that we want to do. Right. Like I have stuff that I like to do. Like, uh, you know, I don't I don't not that my kids, you know, I don't cuss because I don't want my kids cussing. You know what I mean? It's not like that's the terrible thing. Right. Because my all my friends do, <laughs> you know, they, they cuss around the kids and they they cuss around my kids. I just don't do it. Mm. And I don't have you know, I'm not I'm not mad at them. You know, I don't have a little issue with it. It, it is what it is. Those are words. They're going to hear those words. But for me, I feel like I need to use better words to explain myself. To exactly. Exactly. Because I feel like I'm the most important influence that they're going to get. And. Mm. How how impressionable are kids like as they're sort of growing up like um like with actions like you're talking about there with not swearing like how impressionable actually are they? Yeah, kids kids are funny, man. They have a really really uh special way of picking up on the stuff that you want them to and the stuff that you don't, right? Like you you, you say a word like cussing for example, right? You say something and it's the exact thing you don't want them to say. They say, right? Like they're just gonna pick up on it. Because you are, again, their example of what a what an adult should be. And every kid is trying to mimic you. That's why they walk. That's why they talk. 
That's why they, they do everything they do is because they're trying to be like you. And so I think we don't we don't realize that when they're young, like we're not thinking about it that way, but they're literally getting everything that they are becoming from you. I think I heard it said the other day that as a father, you're your child's inner voice until their inner voice matures. And mm. so when little kids are doing stuff, they learn their morals and values from hearing you say, don't do that or do that or not that or this. And so when they're thinking, they're hearing it in your voice until they're, you know, at an age where they can start doing that themselves. Yeah. Uh, Mikey, could you pull up the video of uh, the Des Bryant video? We did have a video I wanted to uh, show you. I think you might you might have seen it already, but I just wanted to get your thoughts and opinions on it to see if it's uh, something you agree with. Read something to you real quick. I mean, lots. Man, I ain't trying to grab it. Let me read something. It's been on my phone for a while. Break generational curses. Quit yelling at your kids before they go to bed and expect them to sleep well. Quit yelling at your kids in the morning right after they wake up before school and expect them to have a good day. You set the tone for your children. You set the tone for... The, you set the tone for your voice that will always remember in their heads. You become the inner voice. Don't be the inner critic. Speak life, speak love, speak bravery, kindness and hope. Speak wisdom and truth. Most of all, listen to your children. How how important is that? It's extremely important. Um, I think I think with the first time I saw that, I was like, man, I one, you can hear the pain. In, in his experience, right? But then two, as as a father, we are the most influential. Like moms are amazing. And unfortunately, there's a lot of single moms who have to do it on their own for whatever reason. But but as a father, you have you have a, like an innate level of power just by being who you are. Uh the way that you talk, the way that you conduct yourself, the way you talk to them, the way you treat other people are all examples of who they should be. Like for most children, if your father's in your life, he's automatically a superhero to you. Like no matter what, like you think he can, you think he can lift up the house and you know what I mean? He can, he knows everything, right? He just automatically is that. And it's not because you've seen him do anything special. Like I never seen my dad lift a truck off a lady, but I felt like when I was a kid, my dad could lift up a truck if he wanted to. My dad was <laughs> the strongest dad in the second grade. You can't tell me nothing otherwise. Right. <laughs> but but he's like five ten, a buck eighty. He ain't that, you know, he's strong, but he ain't strong, strong, you know. But but for me, it just it that's how it how it plays out. And I think most kids are like that. And I think that's the enormous responsibility, I think, is what you heard in his voice is how how big that is, how much that means. Uh, especially for someone knowing a little bit of Des Bryant's story that didn't have that. Right. Didn't have the example of of the things that he's mentioning. Right. Of not being an inner critic of, of being an example of love, of being an example of of care and kindness and all those kind of things. Um, I think that is something that a lot of us can learn from. And that just that one clip uh, as we as we kind of grow in fatherhood is like our our examples may not have been the best, but what we heard there is like a call to action mm, yeah and not not passing down them um barriers that might be set on you from your parents if uh, not like like you said if your father's not in the picture or if your father wasn't the best to you don't pass that down onto your kids break that sort of generational curse as he said exactly yeah, break exactly. the cycle yeah yeah and and, and i think that in every in every family line in every family tree there is somebody, there's one person that decided that they were going to make something different, right? <laughs> if you look at all the quote unquote wealthiest families, where however they got wealth, and a lot of times they got wealth through, you know, ill means, but they decided like, yo, we're, I'm going to do this and I'm going to change it, right? And typically they were a poor family up until that point. And then somebody was like, yo, I'm about to do this and I'm changing, the, I'm changing my family's trajectory from now on. And it could be the same thing with some of the stuff he talked about. It's not mm. wealth, but it, but it's there's still generational, quote unquote, generational curses and things that are passed down that are emotional 
uh, or, or that are, are just verbal, right? Just the way we talk to our kids. You speak when you're spoken to. Uh, you don't talk when grown folks are talking. Because I said so is the best answer for why you can't do something. Like those kind of things get passed down. Uh, and without anyone stepping in and saying there's a better way to do it, then that's just what we do because we fall back on how we were parented unless we work on ways to parent better. 100%. Uh, Rod, could I ask you to just move your camera slightly just so you're in yep. the middle? Yep, yep. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let rain go for a bit because I feel like I've been hogging you, man. <laughs> <laughs> What's the toughest parenting challenge you've had to face? Um, okay, so you... no, this is this is this is something I talk about often. So I have two daughters, right? Um, I am. I have sisters. I only have sisters, so I'm the only boy. So I've been allowed to just be a boy. Right. Like I've just, you know, be tough, you can fight, you can do all the like my dad and my stepdad was like, yo, you just get to be a rough and tumble, do whatever you want to do, go outside, get dirty, dig in the mud, like just be a boy, right? Uh, which also comes with uh you don't have any emotions or you don't get emotional, right? Boys don't cry. Uh so I my wife jokes all the time that when we met I had no emotions, like I was just in the middle. It was like I was never happy. I was never sad. I was just in the middle. Um, and then, as you can imagine, when you're raising young girls or even in the marriage, being emotionless is not ideal, right? Like just not having like uh, not having any connection to your own emotions or having any emotional intelligence is very difficult when you live with women, right? There's three of them in here. And if I don't have an understanding of how I am showing up socially uh, or, you know, how they are feeling, whether it's facts or not, right? I have to respect their feeling and then address it with facts, right? But that's been the toughest for me because that hasn't been who I was, right? Like I, I just was an unemotional person. Like I just didn't, things happened and it was like, yo, it could be worse or things were good. And it was like, oh man, I'm glad that it wasn't where, you know what I'm saying? Like I just didn't. Mm. So it's been, it's been, that part has been the toughest for me is just like embracing the fact that there are more than three emotions, right? The way I, I lived up to this point is I was happy or I was sad. Mm. And if something made me sad, I was mad about it. And that was it. Right. Like I just didn't have time for other stuff. And honestly, I didn't have time to be sad or mad because I felt like those wasted energy. So I even kind of tucked those away. Um, and so having, having daughters has kind of forced me to embrace the entire emotional wheel, uh, has forced me to kind of look at life through a different lens, uh, of not being so tough of not get over it, uh, uh, you know, rub some dirt in it, get, get back on the, you know, get back on your feet kind of thing, what you're crying for that kind of stuff is, 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 uh, it's not dead to me, but it, it, I have to let it go. Right. Because that, mm. that was those those are things that served me in my upbringing, but don't serve them. And that's kind of been yeah. the toughest thing for me. Yeah, because um, I, I don't have kids and Rain don't have kids, but um, I, I resonate with it because when I'm having an argument with my missus or something happens with my girlfriend and she's like, but this made me feel this way. And I said, but I didn't say it in that way. I said it in this way and I didn't do it. And it's sort of just, you go around in circles because I'm trying to go off more logic. She's going off, but it's, I felt like this because you said it this way. Right, right. Yeah, there's there's a whole lot of that, right? And it And it's... And it's just the way that we communicate, right? Women communicate with their feelings and how they felt, how, how something made them felt. Whether it's the way it happened or not, this is the way it made me felt. So this is the reality of the situation. While guys on the other, other hand are like, we act like we don't, but we do. We just don't as much as them, right? Like every time you've seen a guy get into a fight with another guy, it was because he was in his feelings. Like he felt a way about it. It wasn't like an actual fact. Somebody said something about him. It made him feel a certain way, whether it was true or not. You know, we can act like we don't have feeling. We do. But but we operate with our partners and with people that are closer to us and just facts. Like, what do you need? OK, OK, cool. I can do that. I can fix that. I can solve this. I I said exactly this, regardless how it made you feel. This is what I said. And this is how we operate. Um, and that's where there's kind of like the disconnect. If you don't try to understand the other person and where they're coming from. And the same goes for them. They have to understand me too. It's not like I'm I'm making all the the concessions and I'm getting all in my feelings and, and you know, I'm crying every day. 
<laughs> um, you know, they got to toughen up sometimes too. And they got to just kind of, you know, thug it out for lack of a better term. They have to be able to get through it. Just like I have to be able to get through their emotions. hundred percent, man. This is where it scares me to be a parent. Cause I, I don't know if I think about it so much, but we were speaking about it the other week. There's, because I want to be good at it, you know, there's so many components. And it's like if you're training and you want to be good at running or you want to be good at weightlifting, you understand it's the nitty gritty details. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same for parenting. And that's why it scares me because it's like, like, was you ever ready for it? Or do you, do, like, it just that's, scares me. <laughs> that's a, No, that's a fair question, right? Like, I don't think anyone is ever ready for it. I think you make the decision to be a parent and then you become a parent and then you learn on the job. I think that's kind of what it is. Like everybody's learning on the job. Um, you, you can be better informed, right? You can ask questions, you can read books, you can listen to podcasts, you can do things to make yourself better informed. But I think it's like anything else. Like I, let's say this, you seem like a pretty fashionable guy, right? Like you, you seem like you, you put on some decent clothes, like you wear some stuff, right? That that didn't come from nowhere, right? Like when you decided to put that shirt on with those short, like there was a plan there, right? There was a lot that went into it. It may not have taken a whole lot of energy to think it through, but there has been years of processing. Okay. This shirt goes with this or that those pants go with like, you know what yeah, I mean? You, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So that you kind of start to put those things together. Um, it is a lot though. I'm not going to front. I'm not going to pretend that it's not a whole lot that goes into it. There's a whole lot of my daily energy that goes into how I can be the best father, um, how I approach certain situations. It is scary sometimes. Like, I gotta. Do you I gotta... feel like that's because um, you've done a lot of sports? Uh, and you know what it takes to be at a high level? Yeah, I think, I think that helps. I think that certainly helps. I think sports help in a lot of regards uh, in terms of just your social interactions, in terms of the amount of work that's necessary to achieve success. I think that that definitely plays a role in it. But there's guys who don't play sports that are good fathers or didn't play sports that are good fathers um, or great fathers. And, and some of that they may have learned through through business or other things. Right. It's mm. it's just a matter of like I said earlier, it's, it's the intent that you take into it. Right. Like it's the intent that you take into any situation that, that helps determine the outcome. Right. Because if I walk into the room and I think uh, there's going to be something negative happening, nine times out of 10, something negative is going to happen. Like you're always going to find what you're looking for. The world is like Google. Right. If I type it in, it's going to pop up. Right. Like if I walk into a situation with negativity, negativity is going to find me. It's a matter of time. So when when you're when you're talking about like you're going to feel nervous, like there's no way around it. Like nobody walks into fatherhood, like, you know, chest out, chin up. Like I got this. Right? Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you do, you get fast. humbled pretty quickly. Like it, 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 kids, kids will humble you immediately. Right. The first time they cry all night is going to humble you. Right. Cause you're going to wake up crying with them. The first time you get them fully <laughs> dressed, <laughs> first time you get them fully dressed. And before you get out of the house, they poop all over their clothes. Like that's going to, crush you like yo i spent 45 minutes trying to get you dressed and now we got to go back inside and get you dressed again like that's gonna like this this stuff just happens man and it, it is what it is it's all a part of the process i think embracing the suck part of it the part that mm -hmm. just not fun is is the biggest the biggest uh i don't even know what to call that man it, it helps it just makes it easier why do you think less people are having kids now um I, th I think the worldwide fertility rate from 2022 was, is 2.31 compared to 1992, where it was 3.04. So why do you think less people are willing to have kids now? Man, um, I think, I think people were just a little, a little bit more loose with their, with their, uh, with their activity in 92, to be honest. But, but I do, I do think, uh, people are a little no bit instagram more... and that that's why yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not, nothing occupying their mind right yeah so you you know you you had a girl you spent time with her you know what i mean it wasn't a bunch of whole it wasn't a whole lot of other stuff to do like you spent time and you know time time is time you know um and i think now um there's a bit more awareness around it and a, a bit more understanding of the responsibility that comes with it I don't want to say that like parents in the nineties weren't doing a good job because they were, but I just looking back on it in 92, I would have been nine years old. My daughter's nine years old right now, man. I was, I was 
running the streets, not negatively. Like I wasn't selling drugs or nothing like that, but I was just outside. Like the sun came up and I was outside until the sun went down. My mom had no idea where I was. She couldn't call me. It wasn't like I had a phone. I was just, I was, I remember talking to my cousin the other day and we were talking about it. Like we used to ride our bikes to another city and looking at the map, it's like 15 miles away. And we're like 10, 11 years old. We'd ride the bike 15 miles away. Nobody knows where we are, right? Times are just a little bit looser then. Like anything could have happened at that time, right? And so parents, it wasn't as stressful as it is now. Well, not that it wasn't as stressful. It wasn't as involved as it is now, right? Like you look at parents now and parents are like, they're everywhere with their kids. They're fully engaged. And it's a good thing, right? But like, we're completely involved in a kid's life. You can only do that so many times, right? When you... When your kid leaves the house and he's gone for 12 hours, you, know, you can have two more kids because then they all going to be gone. But I still got time to do what I got to do. Uh, yeah. And I think that part's a little bit different uh, as well. But I don't know, man. Obviously, kids are expensive. Uh, yeah. I don't know how things are out there, but it's expensive out here, dog. To have a kid, is is it costs you some money. Uh, well, you're in California so, as well, which is, is, is that's why everyone's everyone's trying to get out of California. That's, yeah, man, that's what, it's a mess, man. Uh, yeah, so the cost of living is is intense, and kids are expensive. They always want something, always need something, um, and so you know, with everything, groceries are expensive. You got to feed them. <laughs> you know, what I mean? like mm-hmm. it's a, it's a smart, it's a business decision at this point. Like people are like, yo, yeah. I, I'll have one or two, and that's enough, right? Yeah, because because obviously, back, I suppose in nineteen ninety two as well, like the the father would be working, and that would be enough to provide for the kids, the mum, everyone right. in the household. Whereas right. now, it's not it's not really enough. Not, not even just in America, in England, like England, it's, it's sort an economic of, issue. Yeah, it's an economic issue. I think it's everywhere at the minute. Yeah, no, I think I agree. I agree, and that's why I said it's like a business decision. Is because you could you can have six kids. I think everybody's, everybody's reproductive organs work the same way they did in 92. Like, you know I mean? That hasn't changed, but I think what, well, I guess people would argue the types of stuff they put in food and all that stuff, but that was a whole nother conversation. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but I'm assuming that people are still practicing the same way, right? Like people are still, you know, doing everything that they were doing before. Uh, but it's like, yo, I don't want to have more than two kids. Like I, I, or initially, I, I, the first one was like, I was cool with one. Uh, and then we had our second one, and we can't imagine a life without her, but I definitely didn't want three. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, because that third, third, a third person to have to take care of, a third person to have to feed and clothe and be mindful of. And it just, it was like, yeah, nah, we're good. We're done with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how has religion played a role in raising your kids and just your life in general? Um, so in my life in general, my mother, uh, my mother is a pastor. Um, so I've been heavily in church since I was, you know, walking. Um, and so I was, I I spent a lot of time in church and my mom did that on purpose because we lived in a, in a bad neighborhood for, for a a large portion of my youth. And so it was like, I didn't get to play outside because we had to go to the church on Monday. We went to church on Tuesday. We were to church on Wednesday. Thursday, we might have do something different. Friday, we was in church Saturday. Like, we were always at church. Um, and so I think it's kind of provided for me my 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 system of values, my guiding principles. Um, I try to lead my family in what I would consider to be a godly way. Um, I align my vision for them with with my beliefs. Um, you know, I, obviously I, I'm teaching them some, no, I'm not as, I'm not as hardcore as my mom was, uh, with religion. Um, but you know, because I feel like they have to have their own connection to their creator, right? Like I, I can't, I can't, I can intercede for them. I can go in between, I can pray to God for them, but ultimately they have to have their own relationship. And so I'm not forcing it on them. <laughs> like my mom forced it on me. Uh, but, but by keeping my relationship and by speaking openly about it, by, you know, going to church, uh, when we go to church, uh, I think I'll, I'm again, leading by example. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's an important component regardless of what your faith is, because I know everybody's going to have different beliefs based on where you're from, where you were raised or upbringing. Um, I think, you know, regardless of that belief, you have something or someone that you believe in that's bigger than you. 
Um, and that typically guides the way that you move in the world. And I think as a father, regardless of what your religion is, you kind of use that as a, as a litmus test or as a guiding light for how you're going to lead your child, right? Because if, if I have a, a higher being that I'm following, then I want my children to kind of follow me in the same way. Not like I'm their God, but like I love them the way that God loves me, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah. No, Did I ask your question? A, there's a, there's a, yeah, there's yeah. A mission, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, hundred percent. Go on. What important role does sports have in um, young kids? Um. So I think it, it depends on the sport, but I think team sports. Uh, when you're playing with other other kids, other athletes. I think you learn a lot about the world. Um, I think for me. I learned a lot about different people because because obviously I could just, you know, stay in my neighborhood and those are the people that I know I live next door to them or whatever. Right. But playing football and going to or playing baseball too, like traveling and going to these different places, playing with these other people that I, that had different experiences than I had really opened up the world to me. Right. When I got to college, I was playing with guys from all over the country. Well, literally, we were playing with guys from all over the world. Like we had a couple of guys that were from Canada. We had a, a kicker from that was actually from Italy. Like we had guys kind of from all over the place. And so you get these experiences that you wouldn't normally have. So the social aspect of it uh, in that regard is, is huge. You learn that hard work, while it may not guarantee success, is always necessary. Uh, you learn how to work with others. You learn how to communicate. Um, you learn how to to uh, align with one one idea right because everybody has the same idea the coach comes with this is the game plan and everybody has to understand it uh and align with it and work together um there, there's so much that goes with it but in, outside of team sports even in individual sports i think you have to learn a lot about yourself and who you are how you function how you think how you process uh i think it's invaluable for for young people i think every kid should play a sport what sport doesn't matter, but I think every kid should play sports of some kind. I think every kid should play a team sport. Every kid should play an individual sport. The individual sport is going to teach you a lot about you and who you are, and the team sport is going to teach you about other people. Mm. Yeah, a hundred percent. I agree with that. Hundred percent. Um, this is it's, it's on topic, but it's a little bit more uh, deeper and a bit darker. I know it's really big in America, or on social media, it seems really big in America with um, the the transgender and um, LGBTQ movement and sort of in schools and indoctrinating children. You see a lot of it online. Um, I've got, I got a short video to show you and then I sort of just want your opinions on that, on how you navigate it with your children. It's not as big in the UK. It's going on in the UK. It's just not as big as what you sort of see on Ameri in America or on social media um mikey could you pull up the second video please out of my four children are trans um and they're all, all part of the lgbt four out of four, four, out of four. yeah oh fam. yeah uh are trans they're part of the lgbtq community the chance you have a trans kid is one in three thousand so the joint probability that you have a trans kid and a pansexual kid is one in nine million. The odds that you're a pathological narcissist sacrificing your own children to the glorification of your compassion is 8,999,999 to one. What's your sort of opinions? Because you see, you see in Hollywood now as well. Um, I think Megan Fox has three kids, and they're they're all um, transgender. Is no, is fun. it is it a cult? Is it? I'm not sure what it is. It feels like it's just being shoved down everyone's throat, though. And this is how you sort of should live. And one side's wrong, one side's right. No, you know what's 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 interesting is uh, I had a, a I was talking to my therapist earlier today. I had a little therapy session. It was our last one. We're closing out right now. Um, but we're talking about what normal means, right? And I think, and I'll speak only for America because, you know, I can't really speak for anywhere else. I've traveled, but I ain't been nowhere long enough to, to speak for anywhere else. But I think in America, being normal up until 
maybe 2000 was like everybody was just trying to be normal and everybody's just trying to whatever we society said normal was like i think back in the 50s 60s it was like you had jocks you had nerds you had cheerleaders like you had like these like boxes that everybody was in i think somewhere along the way people were like yo i don't fit in that box like i don't want to be in that box anymore and so everybody's fighting normal uh because to be extraordinary or to be abnormal has always gotten you attention right like if you're an exceptional athlete you get more attention than just a regular guy on the team i'm not saying anybody's doing this for attention i'm not trying to get canceled but what i'm saying is, is that i think there's been such a large push for everyone to be anything that they want to be um and i think in the in the 90s it was always like the sky's the limit you could be anything you want to be and that's kind of true right you can be you can be anything, but you can't be everything. And I think there's been this idea that everything is an option. Um, and and so as we got more progressive, that's kind of the the side effect of progress of progress, right? Like we fought for uh, like as as you know African Americans in America, we fought for equality and acceptance. And you know there are some things that are going to come with that, right? There's some good and there's some bad, right? And I think the same thing goes for the LGBTQ community is they fought for acceptance and equality. And there's some other things that come along with it, right? That there's, there's like now the spectrum is huge, right? The spectrum used to just be like, okay, there was, you know, there were gay guys and there were lesbian girls and that was like it. But then there's people that, again, don't fit into those boxes, right? There's like, you know, once, once you start trying to just label people, People are going to say, I don't fit in that label because people are, are multidimensional. Mm-hmm. Now, where I get weird on it is, is I don't think at a certain age, you really have an understanding of that or what that means, right? Like you just enjoy life when you're a little kid. And sometimes that means you like, you like the girl cartoon more than you like the boy cartoon. Like you just don't... It, that one's funny. This one's crashing cars. Like you really don't like crashing cars. Like you just like, you like the storyline in that one. And then it kind of goes into, okay, well, he really likes the princess movies. So maybe he wants to be a princess. But I mean, I think the more you see the princess movies, the more you align with the princesses, right? You start to see similarities between their story and yours. And the more you watch it, you're like, oh man, dang. Like that, she's just like me. I'm just like her. And now before you know it, because everyone's open to everyone being anything and uh, there is no such thing as normal anymore, then, okay, then dress like a princess if you feel that way, right? And I'm not saying that that's not real, uh, but I think sometimes we, we, we allow our feelings to dictate our facts. And because we don't want to hurt anyone's feelings and we don't want to label anyone and we don't want to put anyone in a box because we don't want to be put into a box we allow there to be a boxless world where anything can be everything. And then the issue with that is, is that those individuals grow up with those ideas and thought processes. And then they pass them down, whether it be malicious or not. If I, if I am a certain way, let's say I don't like, I don't know. I don't like long sleeve shirts. Right. You got a long sleeve shirt. So me and you got issue. You rolled them up, but I don't like it because I know it's a long sleeve shirt. Right. <laughs> when I go to school and I'm a teacher and a kid comes in with a long sleeve shirt, I'm immediately going to have some issue with his long sleeve shirtness. Right. And so I not only that, but I'm also telling the kids in the class like, hey, I'm going to adjust the temperature up and down so that you don't have to wear long sleeve shirts. Right. I'm going to do things to make it so that you don't have to because I don't like long sleeves. You probably shouldn't like, long, you know what I'm saying? So there's kind of this yeah. bleeding effect of like things just continue to get further and further away from the idea of quote unquote normal. And I don't think it should necessarily, necessarily subscribe to normal, but there is an issue when it, when there's no boundaries, I think boundaries are healthy. Yeah. And when you don't have them, I think sometimes boundaries prevent you from doing something. And I think sometimes they protect, protect you from doing something. I don't know. I don't know if we know the difference right now. Like we, we don't know if those boundaries are for us to be protected or prevented. And so we're just like, no boundaries. You just do whatever you want to do. Um, and I'll say my daughters, uh, go to school with, with children who are, who are trans and I have a fourth grader and she has, you know, friends that are friends at school that are like, 
biologically not what they are. Like she's calling them they, them, or her, him, and it's not what they are. And that, I guess the world that she's kind of grown up in or going to grow up in is I have to do my best to make sure that she, regardless of what they identify as, she treats people with the, the honor, love, and respect that she wants to be treated with. Do I agree? Not necessarily, but that's also not my place, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm not here to judge them, right? And I'm, I'm here to help if I can, guide yeah. if I can, be an example if I can, right? But I can't tell people necessarily what to do, and without you know, without getting canceled for sure, uh, but but without it being a, a larger issue than maybe it should be. Yeah, no, I understand. Agree. I thought I'd just ask questions. Obviously, we we don't have kids, and we don't. Like I've heard stories in England about it in some schools and stuff like that, but not really to the extent as I've seen it on social media with uh, in America. Yeah, I haven't had to deal with it like with like a teacher. Uh, but I mean, to be honest, man, like when I was in school, this is you know, I, I when I got into school, I was it was like eighty seven. I was four uh four or five in, into elementary school i remember in third grade my teacher was gay that didn't make me gay like you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. but there was some issue with it like parents i remember there was like some some grumbles about it right um but it didn't have any effect on me i'm still who i am like i didn't think anything of it like my my in all honesty my godfather is gay um and obviously has been my whole life he's my mom's best friend for a really long time and Again, like I spent a lot of time with him, got to know him, hung out. He's my godfather. You know what I mean? Like didn't have any effect on me. So I think there's a lot of worry about things that aren't necessarily things you have to worry about. But I do think that enough influence, if you aren't present the way that you want to be present, it can affect maybe what you thought your outcome of your child would be. Yeah, that's what I think the problem is. It's where parents are not present and this narrative is getting pushed. And then yeah. and it's, I feel like the children are actually seeking for something because they're not getting it from the parent. Yeah. 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 Hey, listen, when you, when you put, when you post this, if you put that clip out there, people are going to be mad at you. <laughs> parents are going to be upset because parents <laughs> do not, the parents do not take blame for uh, things that are happening to their kids. It is everybody else's fault. But this is again, like business, then you wouldn't go far in business if you're not going to take the blame. It's extreme yeah. ownership. No, I, I agree 100%. But, like, same ownership. That's again, that's why it scares me having kids because I feel like I know so much that goes into it. And I see these other people having kids, even though it's not really none of my business. But I'm just thinking, there's how, like, how are they doing this? And then I know that's so much that goes into it. I'm just looking and thinking, I don't know, it just it baffles me. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is, it's, it's tough, man. But I, because I feel I mean, like some people shouldn't even have pets, let alone children. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to say it straight. I was holding it back, but I'm just going to say it straight. Like, I don't think a lot of people should have kids because parents, you have to understand who you are. And like you said, you have to understand what your emotions are. And that, that's the thing that I'm starting to learn about myself because my missus says it a lot that I'm not present or I'm very cold and my emotions are a bit off. So like you said, imagine having girls and you're trying to deal with that around your kids and you you don't notice that. That yeah. can be detrimental. Yeah, I think I think knowing now or knowing knowing now what I didn't know then and what I've learned is that prior to having children, like you asked earlier, you know, would you be ready? No. But I think there's you can do work, right? Like when you walk on to let's say you walk onto the field for the championship game. You don't know what's going to happen in that game. You game plan for sure. You have some ideas or some strategies or some things they might do, but you don't actually know what's going to happen. But the one thing that for sure did happen is that you prepared for that game. And a lot of times we have kids without the preparation. We're just having kids because, well, we've been together for a while. We're married. That's like the next step. Or we just enjoy each other so much like it just happens. And now we got a kid. And now we got to try to figure it all out without the preparation. Like we haven't done the work on ourselves to be champions. Does that make sense? Like you become a champion before you hold up the trophy. 
right? Yeah. And a lot of times we're trying to get to the trophy without the work that is necessary. And I did it. Like I'm working, I've been working backwards. You know what I mean? And so like, I, that's just kind of the purpose of, of all of this is like, if I can help men become better men before they become fathers, they become better fathers. Yeah. Right. And so if I don't showcase all of the things that go into fatherhood, if I don't have conversations about all the stuff that goes into fatherhood, then I'm not preparing the next man for his journey. Mm. And here's the crazy part is that if I don't prepare him for his journey, then he's going to raise his kids, maybe not in a good way. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, right? It's 50-50 chance. But his kids are going to, re- they're going to live in the world with my kids. So my kids are going to have to deal with the kid that didn't get, you know, you get what I'm saying? Like, so yeah. as it's a domino that, effect. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I have well, a sometimes, Yeah, sometimes they can break that cycle. Right. Right. And they Hopefully. can look at their dad. Yeah. Because that's like me and him are speaking today at work. Like where we've come from, the background we've come from, we've it's a bit traumatic. But we've looked at looked up to our parents and thought, well, we're not going down that road. We should probably do this instead of that. Yeah. So you can be on like a it can be double edged. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I think you can use it as as a motivation to be different or 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 not. Right. Like you can just be like, oh, I really like that. And I, that's what I do. There's some things that my dad did that I really liked. There's some things he didn't like that. I'm just like, oh, I don't want that. I'm getting rid of that. I, I think that's the problem with society at the minute, though. They 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 think they have to agree 100 percent with what everyone does. Otherwise, they don't resonate with that person. So, for instance, uh, for instance, you, you like you just said there, you took parts of what your dad done and parts that you were like, I wouldn't do that. Doesn't change your love for him doesn't change the fact how you look up to him and it's the same with uh, people on tv like you might resonate like donald trump for instance he might say one thing good and then five things you're like well i don't like that but i like the one thing same with kamala harris and people can't put the two together at the minute it's sort of like well you like that one thing he said you're completely we can't we can't mess with you Mm -hmm. i think i think it's because there is a there's a natural us versus them uh mentality right and i think it it might even go back as far as prehistoric times if you believe in evolution is right like if we're all in the same tribe it's us versus them so in order for us to stay together we have to find all the things we don't like about them so that we stay because if you start liking stuff about them then you're them yeah right (laughs) like we can't trust you in our tribe anymore because you you're aligned with the thoughts and stuff that they like because so you might take us out one night because you like what they're talking about Right. So as soon as you start to say so, it's, it's funny, as much progress as we've, as we've made, how prehistoric our thinking is. Right. It's like it's, we're, it's we're very um, emotional. Yeah. Yeah. We, we don't want to see right? the facts or the logic. This we, we do anything it takes to wipe down the other side. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No one's trying. Like, it's like we've lost that, uh, the middle ground. No one wants to ask the questions and say, oh, hold on. Like you said, wait a minute. Let's try to understand this and let's understand this and we can put two and two together. Right. Now, I think there's a select few. And that's it. Can I, can I ask you guys, because you guys are, are younger than me, right? Do you think that social media plays into that? And here's why I ask that. is because when you see a post, you have an option to like or nothing, right? So you either like it or it doesn't even matter to me. It's dead to me. Right. Mm. Do you think that that has anything to do with like like we're talking about now or like if Donald Trump, for example, says something, I like what he said or he's dead to me and mm. I just keep moving on to the next thing. Uh, for, from my perspective, I'm I'm 25. Uh, Reigns. 27, 28, 27. Yeah. So, you uh, so from my. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we're still quite young. I feel but I feel like maybe we were the last generation. Well, that- we grew up similar with uh, the last generation without a phone. Like when I was 16 going into school, I never, I never had a phone. I didn't take a phone into school. We sort of had phones when we'd come home, but I'd never have a phone in school. It was still sort of, like you said, grew up, like you'd go outside, play out. I'd get a whistle and I'd know our oh, dinner's ready because I just heard yeah. a whistle. Okay. So okay. Um, uh, I think social media's, I think it's a great thing, but I also think it's ruined uh kids i think it's ruined adults i think it's it's the reason why mental health's probably spiked i don't think our brains can take that much information that much viewing of stuff um that much different perspective 
I don't think our brains are actually evolved to take that much uh, stuff. I, I don't think we can comprehend it. We can't yeah. break it down. Yeah. Too much computing power. Yeah. Well, then, then does that does that point to what I was saying? Then is it is it so much so much to process? Then I just got to say yes or no to something. Yeah, right? and like, it's easy just, to push a narrative. Yeah, it's like, yo, I'm just going to be follow the big, Yeah, we follow the bigger group. Yeah. Oh, this guy's got more likes. We're going here. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to hear that side. We want to go this side. And yeah. This is what it, 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 it's... Uh, whatever group shouts the loudest. Yeah, whatever group shouts the that loudest. Way. Yeah. This is where it gets scary, though. <laughs> That's where I think uh, social media can be a scary what, place. What are you like with social media with your kids, if you don't mind me asking? They don't have any. Um, so my oldest just turned 12. My youngest is nine. She'll be 10 in October. Um, they have, well, my, my oldest got a, a phone for her birthday, um, but she doesn't have any social media on it. It's literally just, you know, text messages. And well, I guess YouTube is technically social media now. It didn't mm -hmm. used to be, but now it's like social yeah. media, basically. Uh, so she has YouTube. Um, but I'm, I don't even think adults can handle social media well. You know what I mean? So I'm I'm trying to hold off on that as long as possible. We held off on the phone as like like she's had friends that had phones since they were in like first and second grade. So we made it a long way without it. But now because she's she's out of the house a little bit longer, she's further away from her home where she's at school. She goes places for sports and for friends. Like we kind of need a way to contact her uh, or for her to contact us if something happens. So that's why we got her a phone. But uh, I'm I I didn't have a phone until I was in college. You know what I mean. Yeah. And even then, it was kind of a trash phone. Looking back at it, you know what I mean. Yeah, like, you you can't get Facebook, YouTube. Like right. you, sometimes you're not even coming off because you're going from one thing to the next thing. Yeah. And if you've been on it a bit too long, everyone knows you get that brain fog, and it's just yeah, your, your brain's numb. I heard someone say the other day with uh, and and I really believe this. It's like it's it's not so much that you know, when you give your kid a phone and they have access to, to social media, it's not so much that you're giving them access to the world as you're giving the world access to them. Right. Mm -hmm. Because like you're talking about the things you're scrolling through, all of that is, is well thought out, well programmed. The algorithm is a genius. You know what I mean? It's putting things in front of your child that they, that they think it want, that they think they want to see. And even if it's wrong, if they watch it longer than three seconds, they're going to get more of it. Right. Like mm -hmm. just a little kid. Most little kids don't understand stuff. So when it comes up, they're curious. So they watch it for a little bit longer than we would. We would just swipe away because we already know ah, that's stupid. I don't want to see that. Right. Mm -hmm. But they they stay on it a little bit longer. And before they know it, that's all that's on their timeline. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's all they're going to see now. Right. Especially younger kids, because they don't really have any any context on the world. So they get caught up in these things. And so I, I don't think social media is good for kids at all. And, and, and uh, like, honestly, there's a lot of immature adults that probably shouldn't have it either. Mm. See, do you know, do you know the one thing that really uh, annoys me is when I see, when I go out for dinner and uh, I see the parents and they have the two kids and they have, they give them iPads mm -hmm. to sit there with iPads. And these kids are like three, four, maybe even younger, maybe two. And the iPads are there just so they're consumed by the watches so they don't cry or speak or do whatever. And that's real. I'm just like, but you've just, you've just, they're going to want that every time you have dinner now or every time you do this. Like it's sort of a bad um, escape. Yeah, just escape for the to... kids to have. Yeah. It, it's become a, it's become a toddler pacifier, right? Like typically infants have pacifiers and you spend time trying to get them out of it. Like you wean them out of it because you know it's a bad habit. And then you just give them another one, right? And then as they get older, they just continue to stack vices. Um, which is, which is a really unhealthy way to deal with board, which is why creativity is, is, is going down, right? There's less creatives in the world because people aren't bored. Like they used to be like, you used to get bored and it was nothing for you to do. So you just got creative. Like I used to like take stuff apart, build stuff, draw a color, go out. Like there was always like your brain was constantly going with things to do to keep yourself occupied. And now you don't have to do that. Like you, you have no need. Matter of fact, you can watch other people be creative instead of you being creative mm, yeah <laughs> that is, I've never, yeah that is 100 yeah. percent spot on i've never i've never thought of it because when you are on youtube and you're watching these shows that's someone else's vision that's someone else's creation yeah like, to be fair and I've, I've been privy to it i've gone on youtube once and watched someone playing halo like just just playing through the missions 
Yeah. Like something as small as that. So we're all kind of. And you, and you could have played Halo. That yeah, I could have just it. played Halo. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all kind of uh, guilty of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you think kids get accustomed to it and they can adapt? Or do you think this is something your human brain cannot comprehend? I, I, I can't pretend to have the science on that. I do think that this generation of ch- of kids is better better prepared for it than we were uh, because this is their reality, right? This is what they're growing up with. Um, so they have they have a, probably a they have a, a less mature brain, but a more mature understanding of technology. Like you can if you go out like the same family you're talking about, like the, with the three year olds and their life, they, those little kids could probably figure out a phone faster than your your parents could right yeah. their understanding of technology is is through the roof right they know how to do everything is it is it biologically going to be good for them i don't know right like i i don't like you said there's there's only so many things that you can process at at one time i think they are are hyper processors of of information which means they don't have to retain a lot of it which is why the attention span of the average person is significantly going down day after day. Like it was, you know, 20 seconds just a year ago. And now it's like seven seconds. Right. And, and honestly, it's probably closer to like two seconds. Right. Because they don't hook you in that first two seconds. You just keep scrolling. Yeah. Right. Now we're talking about like a goldfish, um, which is which is where kids are now is like they can they can decide whether they want something or don't want something within two seconds whether it's important or unimportant in two seconds. And that's good because that's the world they live in. From our reference, though, because we know a world to be a different place, we're, we're kind of up against it like, oh, that's terrible, right? Like, it just, it just isn't the way it's supposed to be. But in order for them to survive, they're adapting just like, you know, just like a bird would adapt to their scenario or their situation. Like, it's, it's a primitive way to just kind of think about things, but I think they're better equipped for it than we are. Which is why you see adults on social media acting the way that they act. Yeah, we'll be like, like the old boomers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that's us, right? Like we're the old, like get off my lawn, like you kids, <laughs> you know. Uh, but they're like, yeah, this is it. They say they just have a different understanding of it. And do I think it's better or worse? I can't. I can't say. Like I don't know. I, I think my parents might be, maybe felt the same way about us in my generation, right? When we start mm-hmm. playing Super Mario and stuff like that, they were like, what are these kids? Those those video games are melting your brain. And we we're like, what? Like, we got this. Like, I, I just jumped on the flagpole. I got a thousand points. You're crazy. Like, yeah, I'm yeah, good. Yeah. Um, but, but I think as each generation goes on, I think at some point it, it works kind of like in a reverse evolution kind of way. You know what I mean? Like our brains have evolved to the point they are now. And I think they're being dumbed down as we continue to go towards technology. Yeah. And it doesn't seem like we're kind of taking a back step away from technology, but it seems like we're, we're going into the fire. Yeah. AI is on the move quick. Yeah. Yeah. And the more, the more, the more young people get involved with it, younger than you guys even, um, the faster it's going to go. Cause they're just curious. They want to see what AI can do. They want to see what, what you know, changing somebody's face and what they can make them say or do. They want to see that, right? And it only takes for one company to to be okay doing it for every company does it, right? Mm-hmm. And then they'll have your face on his face and like you're, you use it. Like and before you know it, it starts off as a joke or something fun or cool to do. And then, it, then it's out of control. Then it becomes their reality though, doesn't it? It's like yeah. even with the headsets now, people don't want to leave them. Yeah, because you're in a different realm. But but that's the thing with the headset. So like you can you can like if you can do more than one thing at once with them headsets, you're gonna you would 10x your workload. 10 10x is sort of like are people just gonna have to catch up with what's going on? So you sort of push back from it, like, whoa, I don't really want to do that. But in certain businesses and stuff, if if people creating businesses with AI and they're 10x in yeah, yeah, 20x in, yeah, would, it, would yeah. like would you have to be in the know as well? Yeah, but it's a slippery slope, man. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Like <laughs> you can exit ten exit to what end, right? Like there's yeah. only so much money you can spend. Right? Like don't get me wrong. Like I I I understand it's young and ambitious, so you want to get as much money as you can, you absolutely should. But there's a there's a point of diminishing returns. Right? Like when you start losing the grip with reality, 
the, where are you spending the money at on more more technology? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, you get, yeah. you get what I'm saying? Like, it, it, I can get it if you're talking about a 10x in your business, so you have greater reach and greater impact and all that kind of stuff. But if it's just just for financial gain or or to speed up the business for financial gain, then, you know, the, maybe there's other ways to do it. I don't know, though, but technology, the way it is, like, right, I, I couldn't be doing this on a, on a typewriter, right? So, like, <laughs> at some point, you do have to catch up. Like you do have to be in the know, like you mentioned, but I think you don't always have to be in the forefront unless you're in the tech industry. Then you have to be right. You have to stay a- ahead of everything. You yeah. also don't want to be, uh, uh, if you're a business, you don't want to be a dinosaur, right? There's tons of uh, businesses here in America that just disappeared because they were stuck on brick and mortar. Like they couldn't imagine being, uh, being online. Like blockbuster video was huge out here, right? Every Friday night or Thursday night, you go to Blockbuster and it was packed. People were renting videos to go watch over the weekend. Then Netflix comes out, or actually, but even before Netflix, you can get to like the DVD and the like the, the little tray. Yeah, you can go get it just at like the grocery store. And then before you know it, but Blockbuster didn't make that switch, they disappeared. They're out of business, right? Yeah. From being a billion, multi-billion dollar company to not existing anymore. Yeah, yes, <laughs> it switches. Um, could, could you talk to us a bit about your four pillars for fatherhood formula and how you help fathers with that formula? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've, we've talked a little bit about them. I, I believe there are four pillars of fatherhood that, that kind of hold up your, you know, your metaphorical house, right? Um, there's faith, family, finance, and fitness. Um, as we mentioned earlier, faith, I think guides your, guides your footsteps, right? It's how you lead your family. You you typically use that as your morals and values. Um, family, obviously, right? If you tell them about fatherhood, then family's got to be one of the most important things that you, that you continue to pour your energy into. Uh, fitness. I, I always say this, like, I love being a father, right? The best way for me to be a father is to be a fit father. Like I can do anything my kids want. They want to go outside and play. Cool. I got the energy for it. You want to go run? Cool. I got it. Come home from work. I'm not exhausted where I can't play with you. I can do anything that you need me to do. Um, but then also, I love being a father so much. I want to be a father for as long as I can. I can't do that if I'm out of shape. I can't do that if I'm overweight. Like some inevitably some disease is going to get me if I don't take care of my fitness. Uh, or I'm going to get injured somewhere and I'm not going to be able to move around the way that I want to move around. So fitness is extremely important. Besides that, obviously, like, I think you feel better when you're in better shape, like as a person, right? The, just life is easier when you're in better shape. Standing up and sitting down is easier. You don't have to like rock out of the chair to get up, you know? Um, and then finally finance. Kids are expensive. Families are expensive. We talked about that, right? If you don't have some type of financial literacy or some type of, of financial income like you have to take care of your finances it just is you you're responsible not only for your children but like we talked about your your family's family right your whole family tree and so your responsibility is not necessarily taking care of your family because if you take care of yourself your family is going to benefit like your kids are going to benefit because they live in the house with you right but the kids beyond them the grandkids right you're working right now to put away money or life insurance all these things to benefit the people behind you not those that are right here with you. Um, so I think those are the four most important things. And when you focus on those four things, I think sometimes we, I'll throw in fun every once in a while as a fifth pillar, um, maybe not a pillar, but a doorway, right? Um, but but those four things I think are most important because they they hold up, as I said, your, your metaphorical house. Um, and so when I'm working with guys, it is it is one or all of those four things. And I don't necessarily put them in order. I personally would put my faith first, but I think depending on where you come into the program or when I'm working with you, one of those things is probably more important than the other, right? Like you come in, man, I'm struggling financially. Like I really can't figure out how to get X, Y, and Z. My business is is struggling. Okay, let's 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 figure out some resources for your finances. Let's figure out how we can make that work for you. Uh, guys, come in out of shape. You know, I want to be the best father I can be, but man, I'm just so tired. At the end of the day, uh, my wife doesn't look at me the same way. Uh, you know, I'm a shell of my former self. Like I used to be a really good athlete. If I told somebody I play sports today, they'd laugh in my face. All right, well, let's work on your fitness. Uh, you know, guys who had 
poor family upbringings, right? They don't look at family the same way. You know, I want to be the best dad that I can be. I just don't know how. I never had a father. I never had an example. I never had a good example of a relationship or a marriage. Like I just, family's my, my most important thing. And so we work on that. Um, and then, and then faith, I think because I work with so many different guys and so many different religions and faiths, um, we, we work over, I'm not converting anybody to anything, right? Like I'm not, uh, that's not necessarily my mission, but I will be a, a willing vessel to kind of guide you and you have to find something bigger than yourself. Even if you don't believe in a deity, you don't believe in a God, let's say you're an atheist and you believe in yourself and you've willed the world to do whatever it is that you want to do. Well, then if you believe in yourself, then you better believe that if you believe that you've created all these things and you've done all these things and you better believe that you're all powerful and that all those problems that you have, you can fix. And so it's all on you. Right. And even if you do have a deity, I say, you know, you have to believe like it's up to God and then work like it's all on you. And, that, and that's kind of where we where we go. We go through working through all four of those things. Like I said, some guys are more more focused on one thing than the other, maybe multiple things. Um, but uh, along the way, we kind of cover all of them where we get guys to a point where they feel like the man, husband and father that they want to be. It's perfect as well, because it's just from speaking to you over the last hour, you've got the skill set for each one of them pillars. Like you, you ran a business at a high level, so you can help people with their businesses. Okay. You played sports at a high level, so you can help people with their fitness. You, you were going church for five days a week. You can help people with their faith. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, that, that that's brilliant. Um, Rain, do you, we, we're fa so thankful for your time as well, because I know we've gone quite a bit over how however long we are meant to spend with you. Um, do you have any major questions you want to get off there before we go to the two final questions of the podcast? No, I think we hit everything. Because I could sit here for hours with yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> I could sit here for... <laughs> That's cool. That just means we got to do it again. Yeah, no, 100%, 100% man, 100%. And like, like I said, thank you for coming on as well. It mean, means a lot to us. Um, the, two, the two final questions of the pod, we ask everyone this that comes on. The first one is, how do you want to be remembered? So in life, how does Roderick Richard II want to be remembered? Oh, man. It's, I'm getting all these good questions now, man. Um... Ali. So I, I want to be remembered as a loving father and husband, of course, but, but also selfless, uh, caring, determined, hardworking, uh, you know, my tombstone is just be, it's going to be a list, <laughs> right? Just the, just the bullet points, like he, bullet here points, yeah. I, and his bullet points, right? It looks like a, 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 a PowerPoint presentation. Um, no, I, I think I think there's there's a number of things that I want to be remembered as. Ultimately, what it boils down to is, is something I heard Jason Wilson say, and it's that a man, a comprehensive man, a true man is everything he needs to be when he needs to be it. And so that's why I say there's a list. I want like, people to think of me and think of a topic and be like, oh, shoot. Yeah, he did do that. Well, you know what? He did have that characteristic. I remember that time he was funny. Like he told Joe, like he was, you know what I mean? I want everybody to have, when we bring up something to have a story other than like, oh, he was a, he was a jerk. Like, I don't want that one. Yeah. You can leave that one off. When you're remembering me guys, don't say the jerk story. Um, but, but I do want, <laughs> but I do want to be remembered as someone who made an impact, who, influenced and and had something that was worth remembering that's brilliant man and the final question of the pod is your most euphoric moment in life so far so a moment that stands out to you it gives you goosebumps when you think about it, it could be winning a d2 title it could be having kids anything that sort of gives you goosebumps thinking about it uh, you know, winning the winning the championship, but that was dope. That was a that's a uh experience that I wouldn't trade for anything uh except I don't even put it on the same level. So let me say I wouldn't trade it for anything. But when I when I found out I was gonna be a father, right? And you, I, you have, I'm sure you had some idea it was coming back to fatherhood, right? But I say this all the time and I call it like my matrix moment, right? We talk about the matrix and where Neo's dodging bullets. Um he's got that kind of that zoom effect and they're coming at him in slow motion. When we found out that we were going to have a daughter, my, my wife went in the bathroom, peed on a stick, came out, 
And it felt like time slowed down and I could see the words coming out of her mouth as she said, you're going to be a father. And that moment of all the things that I was doing and all the success that I had, like I said, I was immediately met with my purpose. And that is by far the most euphoric moment, even above when I actually got to hold my daughter for the first time, like that moment solidified for me who I was going to be in this world. Mm, that's brilliant man that's powerful as well felt like a powerful wake up call 100 percent, 100 percent. like it was it was uh like time stood still you know what i mean like it was just both that's brilliant man Roderick. thank you for coming on the podcast we really appreciate it man thank you for all your time we know you're a busy person um i'm gonna link all your socials down below was there anything we didn't touch on that you that you want to bring up or anything you've got coming up uh no man no I, well i don't know no 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 we're good we're good when is this when is this air i mean let me ask this that. will come out not next in two weeks about two okay. weeks okay from now so from right, wednesday so not mention, next wednesday wednesday after i'll mention i'll mention it only because it may still be going on at that time um, I partner with a, with a fitness company, uh, fitness, future fitness app. And we're doing a challenge for, for September, a back to school challenge. Basically what I was able to do was get everybody a free month of training with their own personal coach, uh, a, a month full of workouts, uh, to get you to whatever your goal is this winter or this fall. Um, along with that, I created a private group, uh, for accountability and encouragement with myself. And everybody else that is signed up. So if it is still in September when you guys hear this, um I'll I'll shoot you guys the link uh for yeah. it. But but uh but I'd love for you guys to join me and uh get get working towards your goals. Cause as I mentioned, fitness is super important. But I think along the way to getting fit, there's so many things that you realize about yourself that help you become the better person. hundred percent. We'll be in it. We'll be with you, man. We'll be grinding. Agree. We'll be grinding in there with the people. <laughs> um, Roderick, thank you for coming on. Like I said, I'll link all your socials below. People, make sure you go check out everything he's got going on. We got a lot of people following you already, so I'm your sure Instagram's when people... a big inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. I spent the whole two weeks and I was like, this is my guy. <laughs> <laughs> this is my guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't think that, I, I if, if you if you don't realize, I think you're doing um the people are world of good. So just keep being great in life. Keep pushing your message and uh, hopefully people love the content you're pushing out and it changes their life. Will do. Listen, if it, if it touched one, right. Just hearing what you guys said just now, that's enough for me, right. That's enough for me to keep going and keep moving forward. Yeah. Thank, thank you for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. hundred percent. hundred percent. Like I said, I'm open to doing it again. If you guys are after post-production, oh. when you look at it and you're like, ah, this sucked. Never mind. No, no, we we we're, we're uh, a lot of a lot of the podcasts we do is more it's more for like me and him. We're kind yeah. of on our own journey, and then we like you said went with what you done with the fatherhood. We sort of just recorded it and put it out to the people. Yeah, it's, it's it, but it's it's all for us really. Okay, no, that's cool. Yeah, that's and then cool. obviously we grow and get better along the way. Yeah, I feel like that's how we um because before we were deep in it too much. Yeah, yeah, we we're trying to make it like oh, but we've not got this production. Oh, we've not got three cameras like Joe Rogan. We've not got we this got comparing, this. comparing. And now it's like, what do we like? Who do we like? Let's try and get them on and let's speak about. It. Let's do what we want to do, and it will resonate with someone who's sort of on that similar journey as us. That's it, man. That's it. That's how you get true fans, right? Like you, you could you could pander to everybody out there. You could try to be this type of podcast or that type of podcast, but it'll be disingenuous to you, and you won't enjoy it. So then you'll stop doing it. And that's why most podcasts die, right? It's like, oh, we're and trying that's to... That's what started happening. Yeah. Started getting to the point where you're not enjoying it. And yeah. I was just like, this is just... Do I even... I don't even want to film now because I'm filming something that's not as interesting as we want to get to. It was never the guest episodes. It was always, if we were filming one, we always thought we had to do one a week regardless. So then we'd end up just talking about the news or something like that. And it sort of was just like, what what, what are we doing? Like, this yeah. isn't really what we started yeah. it for, wanted to do it for. Yeah, yeah no, I, I personal felt... journeys. I want to yeah. see other people's upbringing similar to ours and how, how can we learn off you? Right. That's the main thing. Yeah. And then people can learn from us. It's just a, you can learn from everyone. Yeah. That's the beautiful Listen, thing about it. The, the, the pressure to create an episode every week is, is, is I think what everybody kind of get runs up against. 
But the reality is, is even my favorite podca- podcast, I don't listen to every week. Like I'm missing, you know what I mean? Like I just didn't get it this week. I'm going to catch it next week and maybe I'll go back to it. But no, there's not a whole lot of people that are, well, maybe there is, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know the stats on that. People are listening religiously every week. I don't know what that number is, but um, I think if you just put out enough quality content, uh, whether it's weekly, biweekly, just sporadically, people are going to be drawn to it because you are doing it authentically. People are drawn mm-hmm. to authenticity. Yeah, again, I think it's a comparison thing. Like you look at the Joe Rogans, you look at uh, the Patrick Bet Davids, but they're 10 years ahead of you. Like were right. they uploading one a week when they when they were three months in or four months in or five months in? Maybe not. Did they have three cameras when they were that deep right. in? Pro- probably not. And it's sort of like you catch them now, ten years on. Well, they've been doing it for ten years. They've been they've been they're way they're way ahead. And you sort of get that Financial, comparison. Yeah, yeah, it's just different. But again, that's part of learning. Right. You right. find your own um, your own way. Yeah. You have to do it to find your way. Yeah, that's the only way. Hey. The, the journey <laughs> is the journey is the way, right? It's not it's not about the destination. It's all about the process. Yeah, no, yeah. hundred percent. But but we're loving it now. Like I said, thank you for coming on. Because I I didn't think you would come on. I was like, you know, there's some people on Instagram you message and you're like, I'll message them, but I'm not really sure. Like, the, 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 there's a lot of followers there. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, <laughs> yeah, no, I try to stay on top of it. The only hard part for me is that it's just. I get so many, which is why I had a like auto responder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it'll get it'll get buried, and I'll be like, yo, I I didn't even I wasn't even trying to be rude. Though. I just didn't see it, you know. Yeah, I just yeah, there yeah. was nothing I could do about it. Um, and then like with all the different tabs, it's like the the primary and general, and like then you get yeah people. requests. Yeah, yeah. Like I can't mean. keep up, so yeah. I try my That's best. That's good. You're doing something good. Yeah, I try my it's best. It's working. Yeah. Do, 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 is this is this you full time now just for no. fit fatherhood no 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 um no i still i still uh i still have a gym where i work with athletes uh i just opened that up a year ago i had no intention of going back to that but uh but i had a really good opportunity um to do it i do it way different than i did now i'm only there two days a week for a total of maybe four hours a week Mm-hmm. Um, so very, very different than what I did before. Um, and I, because I like working with, with kids, I work at a, a, a virtual charter school. So it's remote I work from home, uh, mostly and, and, you know, creating opportunities for students to, to learn and, and be led. So, uh, no forfeit fatherhood is, it's still a side hustle, so to speak, but it's really my passion. It's a passion project is probably the best way to describe it. And I don't know that I'm ever looking for it to be more than that, because I think once it becomes a a job, it's going to feel like a job, you know what I mean? And it, regardless of that passion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, uh, there's people who would say they love their job, but, you know, if they won a lottery tomorrow, they would stop working that job. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm doing yeah, it. I don't, yeah. I don't need to do it. I'm doing it because I love to do it. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's on your terms. Everything's on your, I think that's the thing with, with working once it's, it's not necessarily the working it's being on your terms like you've chose right. to go back to the gym to do the hours right. you've chose to work in the schools because it's something you love so it's it's on your terms now it's not like i've got to be here for 12 hours a day now because i have to do this right right exactly exactly yeah, right. but uh yeah, we'll let you go yeah man. we'll let but, you go we've we've, we've, we've had you for long enough man yeah. thank you for coming on it's been brilliant to meet you as well and uh like i said keep just keep being great man all right, brother. You guys have a good See one. You, and uh, I'll talk to you guys soon.